started. So hello everyone, welcome to Fulbright 101. Um, thank you for joining us on this afternoon. Thank you, especially for our alumni who are gonna be sharing their experiences later. We're very excited to talk to them. Uh, but just by way of introduction, my name is Heidi Bretz, I use she, her pronouns, and I am one of the National Fellowships Coordinators here at the University of South Carolina. We are just getting started with our Fulbright 101 session. So um, I oversee the international awards. So those are more like uh, Fulbright, obviously, as well as Pickering, Wrangell and Payne, Critical Language Scholarship, all things international. And I'm joined today by a couple of my colleagues um, that I'm gonna ask to introduce themselves just to say, hey, um, first off, who, someone who helps me with Fulbright, especially for graduate students that are joining us today is gonna to be Matt Klotfestein. Uh, Matt, do you want to introduce yourself real quick? Yeah, hi everyone. I'm Matt Kloppenstein, he, him pronouns. Um, as Heidi says, I work with graduate students. Um, I also did a Fulbright research grant uh, about five years ago when I was a graduate student. And so I'm happy to share about that experience if anybody wants to meet it and talk about that as well. Thank you. And then we also have Chastity Graham, who is our STEM uh, coordinator for STEM fellowships. So if you're in STEM or STEM disciplines, uh, she is the person for you to talk to. Chelsea, I don't know if, if you wanted to say hello. Sure, I will say hello. Hello, everyone. As Heidi mentioned, my name is Chastity Graham, and I work with students who are uh, majoring in STEM disciplines, as well as students who are competing for STEM awards. Thank you all for joining us. Wonderful. And I'll have our two special guests introduce themselves a little bit later into our program. So just as an idea of what we're going to talk about today, we're going to do a little bit of an icebreaker. Um, we're going to go over the Fulbright program basics. We're going to hear from our um, alumni guests. And then we're going to talk about specifically the USC process. Fulbright does have a national screening process as well as a process that is unique to USC students and alumni. So we'll go over kind of what those differences are and what dates you should be keeping in mind. And then we'll talk about what's next, how you can get started with your uh, Fulbright applica application. So first off, I'm gonna have you type in the chat. If you could hop on a plane tomorrow, where would you go and why? I'm giving you a free ticket to anywhere. Where are you heading? thinking about this earlier and I think I would probably go to either Paris just that had on the brain recently or maybe Thailand. All right, Switzerland or Iceland, awesome. So feeling a little bit chillier on this 80 degree day, looking for some chillier weather. Awesome, Cape Town, their first block of stay abroad, would love to go back. Norway would be, Norway would be fun. Um, yeah, Cape Town is awesome um, and have not been to Norway, so very fun. Awesome. Well, one of the ways that you could potentially go to some of these places is with Fulbright. Um, so just kind of by way of introducing fellowships generally, um, national fellowships are awards that are sponsored either by the government, by different foundations, different organizations that fund um, certain experiences. So it's funding from outside of the University of South Carolina to do things like internships, um, study, English teaching, um, all sorts of really cool things. So I love this, this joke. Thank you, Matt, for um, sharing it with us. But the uh, tweet says, do you want me to apply for a fellowship after what happened to Baromir? So if any of you are Lord of the Rings fans, you'll know who Baromir is. The fellowship did not end well for him, but hopefully you will have a better experience. Um, so national fellowships are nationally competitive. So what does that mean? Nationally means obviously there are folks from across the country and potentially even across the world um, that are applying for some of these fellowships. Competitive means that there are more people who are interested in the fellowship than there are spots. Um, that varies quite widely as to what that actually means for applicants. Uh, fellowships can have anywhere from like a one in four students are awarded to like, if you're applying for Fulbright Open Study UK, you might have 83 students competing for one award. So basically the, the fellowship being competitive means that there are more people interested than they have slots, but we can help you put forth your most competitive application. 
So that's what we're here for. The National Fellowships team is here to help advise you through that process, to help you find which program fits you the best, which fellowship is the best fit, and to help you prepare your application materials, uh, prepare essays, prepare for interviews, all sorts of things that are related to pursuing these kinds of inter or national competitive awards. So we're here specifically to talk about Fulbright. So the Fulbright program is a program that was created by the US Congress and is sponsored by the US Department of State and the Bureau of Education and Cultural Affairs. So this is a fellowship um, that is definitely tied to building mutual understandings between nations, advancing knowledge across communities and improving lives around the world. So Fulbright's mission is to build connections. So if you are someone who also shares that mission, Fulbright's a great fit for you. They have this real emphasis on cultural ambassadorship and really being a good representative of the United States abroad. So that's something that's really important as you're beginning to think about Fulbright, where you fit within that program, keeping that top of mind. Um, Fulbright is inherently collaborative. So it does have a US portion and an international portion. So the US student program portion is administered in the US by IIE, which is a uh, international organization that does a lot of study abroad and other fellowship sort of activities. And then they partner with binational commissions um, or embassies in other countries, the country in which you're applying to evaluate the applicants for Fulbright. So when you uh, apply for Fulbright, you're first evaluated by the US folks who read over your application. And then if you advance to the semifinalist round, that is reviewed by folks in the host country. So again, Fulbright is extremely collaborative. So that's a little about the history. So what, what is Fulbright? Um, Fulbright is a program that is looking to give, uh, to award a year of funding for either English teaching, study or research internationally. And this can be in a number of different countries and each country has something a little bit different they're looking for. But something that every Fulbright program is looking for um, is diversity and inclusion. So really thinking about the diversity of the United States. The United States has many cultures, many identity groups, and really what Fulbright is hoping to do is to have the folks that are participating on Fulbright look like the folks that live and work and are in the US. So really finding uh, that balance is really important for Fulbright. They're also very intentional about encouraging, engaging, and supporting individuals throughout the application and award process. So of course, um, providing resources um, at the beginning for uh, example, for folks with um, disabilities who are accessing these opportunities, folks who are first generation, um, all sorts of different identity groups. They have different trainings and resources available for uh, the Fulbright process. And then once you are abroad, Fulbright is supporting you through that process as well. Um, I know several countries have different uh, local groups that will uh, support applicants while you are overseas, as well as the U.S. Embassy. And then when you come back, you will become part of the Fulbright alumni. So that's another way that you will be supported throughout your experience. And I'll have our uh, alumni talk a little bit more about their experience being part of that Fulbright program family. So who is eligible? So for the Fulbright U.S. student program, you are eligible from the time you have your bachelor degree confirmed. So by the time you graduate, all the way through the conferral of your doctorate. So you have quite a length of time to be able to take advantage of this opportunity. You do have to be a US citizen by the application deadline and that bachelor's degree does need to be awarded by the time your program starts. Um, there are also country specific requirements that vary on where you are headed. So what does that mean for you? So graduating seniors, um, recent graduates, graduate students, and early career professionals are all great um, Fulbright U.S. program applicants. So for graduating seniors, you would apply this year and all of the programs that we're talking about um, for this coming application cycle, which opens on Saturday, you would be starting your program um, in the 2024 to 2025 academic year. So what can you do with the Fulbright? So Fulbright has a couple of basic award types. So there are the study and research grants, which support independent research, study either uh, independently taking some courses at a university or pursuing a year-long graduate degree. 
at an international university or arts project. So if you're an artist, if you are looking to practice your art, they have creative arts grants as well that will allow you to do that, provide that funding. And they give about 900 of those awards out each year. Um, they can last anywhere from six to 12 months and are, um, you're able to go to about 140 different countries that have funding. And then the other side of the Fulbright coin is the English Teaching Associateship. So this is more like an actual like job placement. Uh, so you will help teach English and US culture in classrooms in over 75 different countries. So they're really looking for um, folks who are native speakers, um, who have varying degrees of experience with education and who are committed to talking about US culture in classrooms and serving as that, again, that cultural ambassador. So they give about 12,000 or 12,000, I wish, on um, 1,200 of those awards each year. And again, that follows the academic calendar. So you're gonna see those awards being about eight to 10 months in duration. So those are the kind of two major categories. Within those um, study grants, there are some partner grants that are for specific universities, some research grants that are specific um, to certain types of research or areas. So again, all of these kind of depend um, on what you're hoping to do. And that will help us as we are going through the advising process to really find out um, what you're interested in and find you the Fulbright that fits you. So application components, what do you need to do to get from here to Fulbright? Um, so the application is fairly straightforward. Um, and the it starts with um, basic personal data and program information. So you talk about an abstract of what you're hoping to do, how you're going to engage in the host country. That's a, again, that, that part of Fulbright that speaks to cultural ambassadorship. They wanna see how you're going to interact with your local community and how you're going to build those relationships and advance that mutual understanding. And then they do wanna know a bit about your future plans. If they're investing in you for Fulbright, how are you going to pay that forward? Um, what kinds of things are you going to do? How does this set you up for future academic, personal and career goals? The meat of the uh, application is going to be your essays. So your essays are actually deceptively short. Um, the statement grant purpose for study research grants is two pages max. Um, and the English teaching assistantship is one page max. So that's not a lot of um, space to talk about what you wanna do. But the statement of grant purpose focuses on kind of the, the how of your, of your uh, Fulbright application. How are you going to do things? What are you going to do? Who are you going to partnership or partner with if you are doing research? Uh, where are you going to study? What makes that program the perfect fit for you? What makes it the, what, what draws you and makes it a good place for you to take this next step? So really thinking about those types of questions. The personal statement is more of a who are you sort of um, getting to know you document. For many of the Fulbright awards, they actually don't do interviews. So they are judging your merit um, based only on what they have in front of them um, that is written. So the personal statement is really important in helping them to get to know you, to know what you're passionate about, what you're interested in, uh, kind of what your origin story is for being interested in the Fulbright and how you hope to use it. So those are some of the things that we as advisors can help with is really coming up with uh, the content of those couple of statements and then helping you to refine those over the course of the summer leading into the application deadline. Um, so if you are going somewhere that has a language requirement, not everybody, not everywhere does, um, you would need a foreign language evaluation uh, for the language that you are uh, hoping to speak while you are there. And then each, um, application does require three references. So for the study uh, research grants, they are letters of recommendation from faculty who have taught you, uh, principal investigators, um, folks who can really speak to your ability to carry out the grant. And then for English teaching assistantships, they actually have a form that they ask your recommenders to fill out that talk about your um, teaching abilities, your ability to uh, teach English in the classroom. So really starting to think about who you might ask for those uh, strong recommendations. And we'll help you with that brainstorming as well if needed. Transcripts, um, you're going to want to, uh, to request an official transcript. And with Fulbright, they don't have a hard and fast GPA requirement. 
they are looking for you to have a solid academic history in your area of focus. So just making sure that, again, you are set up to do what you say you want to do um, in terms of academic preparedness. Some other things, again, it, de it depends on your award type, um, the location that you're going. For research and study, uh, they do often ask for letters of affiliation. So that's different from like a letter of acceptance to a graduate program. An affiliation letter is a letter from the place that you're going, the research folks that you're working with, saying that they are uh, happy to support you, not financially, Fulbright's got that covered, but support you um, while you're in country and kind of be your main point of contact. So that'll be something that if you are doing the study research, you'll want to start working on pretty quickly, but that's something we can talk about as you move through the Fulbright process. And then if you're doing an arts grant, they may ask for supplementary materials, um, examples of your work, a portfolio. And we actually have um, one of our faculty uh, Fulbright program advisors who specializes in creative arts grants. So you'll be in very good hands um, if you are planning to do an artistic project overseas. So that's a lot of information, um, but so you've done all this work, you've done the, you've done the essays, what, what exactly does Fulbright provide for you? So again, this is a year of funding um, for study, research, English teaching, or uh, creative arts projects. And so award benefits before you uh, pre-grant in country, they'll pay for you to get there. They may include a monthly stipend, um, accident and sickness benefits. And if you are doing an ETA, they actually have included now a TESOL fundamentals course, so teaching English to speakers of other languages, so that you'll have that foundation of knowledge um, before you step into the classroom overseas. And the rest of the benefits do vary from country to country. Um, some of them give tuition waivers, some do not, some include language um, activities or um, disability accommodations, research allowance, some allow you to bring dependents and will provide funding, some do not. It really depends. So that's where, again, you'll work with our office, you'll work um, to do your research on the Fulbright website to really find out what your grant is offering and how that works for you. Post-grant, you will become a member of the Fulbright Network of Alumni. I'll let our uh, guests share what that has been like for them. You'll get access to the State Department Alumni website, if you are planning to go into any type of government work, um, Fulbright is a really good foot in the door because you are eligible for 12 months of non-competitive eligibility, which basically means it's much easier to get a federal job after you um, are done with your Fulbright. For the next 12 months, you'll have special hiring status. You'll get a lifetime Fulbright email address, and then you'll also become a part of the Fulbright Association. So again, it's all about continuing those connections and building those relationships. So a general timeline um, for Fulbright is that from now until September, you're working on your application, you're figuring out where you wanna go, what you wanna do, how you wanna do it, and getting all of those pieces together. There will be a campus deadline for um, the University of South Carolina is August 16th at noon. August 16th at noon is the date to put in your calendar. And that will be when a solid, draft will be due to our office. Um, you'll submit that through the through the portal, just like you would the, the actual application. Don't worry, we can give it back to you. Um, it's not final at that point, but that will um, trigger us to set up a meeting for your campus feedback process, where we bring together faculty experts in your field, in the country that you're going to. Um, if you're doing an ETA, we'll have ETA experts, and they read over your application and offer you basically half an hour to 45 minutes worth of feedback, which is extremely valuable and probably the most valuable part of working with our office is being able to get that feedback, which you can then incorporate into your application before that national application deadline on October 10th. So October 10th, you will send your information to Fulbright for consideration. Uh, they'll do a review process. You'll find out most likely in late January as to whether are advancing um, to the semi-finalist round of review. And then after that, um, the different country commissions will be reviewing the application materials and releasing decisions from about March to June. So about this time next year, you would know if you were uh, awarded a Fulbright. That's the, the general overview. 
I'm going to pause. Um, does anyone have any questions before we jump into what makes a good Fulbright applicant? Feel free to put them in the chat or to unmute yourself. All right, moving right along, feel free to put questions in the chat. So what makes a good Fulbright applicant? Who is, who is a good Fulbrighter? So again, Fulbrighters can look a lot of different ways. Um, but one thing that really makes a good Fulbright application is the quality and feasibility of your proposal. Is it realistic? Are you really going to um, go to, I don't know, Inner Mongolia and do research on dolphins? Probably not, that doesn't make sense. Um, hopefully you would, you would be going somewhere that actually had a coast if you want to be um, researching dolphins. But thinking about the quality and feasibility of your proposal, who are you working with? Um, does it make sense? Do you have what you need? Are you gonna be able to get it done within the time frame of the grant? So really thinking through those, those things. Sorry, I keep hitting my microphone. Um, strong academics, especially in your area of focus. Again, this is not necessarily tied to a number on the GPA scale, but you really wanna be able to show that you are academically prepared to take on whatever project you are proposing. And probably one of the most important things is clear articulation of why you need to do this specific thing in this specific place. Um, Fulbright is all about fit. It's all about explaining why this is the perfect place for you, um, why you're doing this thing in this place. Again, studying dolphins in Mongolia doesn't make much sense but going to um, Costa Rica to study the, the migration habits of a certain type of sea turtle that's native to that area. That makes a lot more sense as to why you would go and do that. So really being able to talk about um, what you're doing, why it matters, and why you need to do it in this place. Commitment to serving as a cultural ambassador. Again, that's kind of the underpinning of Fulbright is this mutual understanding and this relationship building. So really being committed to engaging with your host community, to um, volunteering potentially with your Fulbright Commission to do talks and um, to come to events and things like that, that again, promote Fulbright. So really that commitment to being a cultural ambassador is key. Language proficiency, if applicable. Um, so if you are planning to do anything in Latin America, you're gonna need some really strong Spanish skills. Um, some places, may not have a language requirement, that's always a good idea to start looking into um, the language of the country and perhaps even do um, a little bit of like Duolingo or some research before you go to build those skills. So again, you can make those cultural connections. And so I've also thrown up here the Fellowship Fit Funnel patent pending. Um, this is my uh, kind of explanation of how to craft a good Fulbright application. So again, you wanna talk about why you, what are your passions, what are your interests, what are your goals? What kind of experiences do you have that make you a great candidate to do this thing in this place? So again, why this partic particular program or project? Um, why do you care about it? Why is it important? What's the bigger picture? So really thinking about those items. And then why here? Why are you going to France to study healthcare? Like what is, what is drawing you to that location? Why are you trying to teach English in Thailand? What's your connection there? What's your thought? What are you hoping to do with that? Uh, why now? Why is now the best time for you to do this? Um, is it in between like maybe undergraduate school and medical school? Or are you planning to uh, pivot into a TESOL career and you wanted to get some experience before you did so? Why is now a good time for you to do this thing? And then finally, again, remembering Fulbright's mission and Goals. Why is Fulbright the mechanism that should fund you? What makes you like a good Fulbrighter? How, what kind of values do you share in common with Fulbright? So that's kind of the fellowship fit funnel. That's what you're trying to um, demonstrate through your application is why you, why this thing, why here, why now, why Fulbright? All right, again, why Fulbright? Why Fulbright? Please make the connection and we can help you do that. Okay, well, enough about me. I feel like I have been talking a while. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to the people who really know what they're talking about. Um, we're so lucky today to be joined by uh, Peyton Ramsey and Tamara Sullivan, who are two USC uh, Fulbright alums. And so uh, Peyton went in 2021 to Cardiff University in the UK to get her master's of public health. And Tamara Sullivan went to National uh, Taiwan University 
to get her award in global health. So we do have two public health people. If you have public health questions, you've come to the right session. But in either case, um, they have different experiences and are happy to share more about that. So I'm gonna ask them to uh, kind of unmute themselves, have their cameras on. I'm gonna show some fancy pictures while they are coming on screen um, just to get you even more excited. Hey guys, so nice to be joining you. Hi everyone, so glad you're here and it's so exciting that you're taking this first step in potentially applying to Fulbright. I hope you all will apply because it was such a great experience. I'll start since this is my slide and my pictures. These are just Thank you. Yeah. some of the pictures from my time in Taiwan. I wish I could encompass it all on the slide, but I will start by saying I graduated from USC in May of 2019. I was a chemistry major and a Spanish minor and ended up going to Taiwan and getting a global health degree. So you just never know with your background where you may end up. Um, I will say my connection, which when Heidi talked about relief and Fulbright, I wanted to know that connection into why this program, why Taiwan, why global health. I had studied abroad at USC in Costa Rica under the global health program, and that just really made me want to learn more. And then I got an email from the National Scholarships and Fellowships Office and the Honors Program at USC. And like you all, went to one of these Fulbright 101 webinars and the ball just went from there, kept rolling from there. And so I started my graduate degree program at National Taiwan University in the fall of 2019 and graduated in 2021. And I will say about the application process, since I know that's the part you all are most that's the one you're most close to right now, getting ready to apply, that really lean on in the help and support of the National Scholarships and Fellowships Program. I want to say I rewrote my essays maybe three, four times. The first essay was, the first draft was just not good, and that's fine because it got done, and they helped me figure out more of like the core of why Taiwan and why global health and from these pictures, you can see a bit of my time there. In the middle, I went hiking a lot. I never liked hiking. I never really went hiking before. I um, lived in Taiwan, but that was an elephant mountain. And you can see Taipei 101 in the back. So there's just so many opportunities outside of class. Even though I was a grad student and had a lot of work to do, there was still more than enough time on the weekends and during our holiday breaks to go hang with friends, go hiking. And you can see in the bottom left-hand picture is some of my classmates. We always had a Christmas party and we actually always had class on Christmas, which was very jarring the first year we did it. And it, it, at least you're with your friends and um, that made the, the, the holiday nice, even though we had class. And every year we had a Christmas party and these are some of my classmates and then other students from the broad, broader College of Public Health celebrating. We had a really big feast. It was really nice. And top left is me and my friend. We went biking around some lake after we graduated. We just stayed in the country a few more months and got to explore. So it was a really nice, really beautiful country. And then in the top right, right hand corner, as Heidi said earlier about with Fulbright, they really want to know how you're going to get involved in your host country while you're there. And then one of the volunteer opportunities I was involved in was called International it was called international like cultural exchange or international student exchange, but we were partnered, international students were partnered with local Taiwanese students at National Taiwan University. And then we together were partnered with an elementary school in Taiwan. So every week for two days, like 45 minutes each, we would Skype with the students and teach them a bit about our culture. I talked about American culture. And they would teach, teach me about Taiwanese culture. And then we ended the semester by going to visit them. And usually the schools we partnered with were in more rural parts in Taiwan that didn't have a lot of connections or interactions with international students. So it was a really great program and I learned a lot from them and I hope they learned a lot from me. And it was just really great. And I got to know a lot more people through this program, both local Taiwanese students and international students. And then in the bottom right-hand corner, that is me and some of my classmates. We, one of Taiwan's biggest things, biggest, what it's known for is pineapple cakes. So this was actually my Chinese class we went to this pineapple cake factory and they had classes where they taught you how to make pineapple cakes. And so instead of having Chinese class one day, we just 
went to this class and it was really amazing. We got to take them home. They were the best pineapple cakes I've had, maybe just because we made them. But yeah, you just never know where you're going to go with Fulbright. And even that Chinese class, I didn't know going into um, the program that I would take it because I was there during all of 2020. So in the summer of 2020 is when in the bottom right hand corner, I took that Chinese class instead of returning to the U.S. because I couldn't. So yeah, you just never know. And I will say too, speaking of Chinese, I did not go into my program knowing Chinese, but I learned it pretty quickly. We were required to take Chinese courses our first year, and then I took the summer classes because I really like learning languages. So definitely take advantage of the opportunities that you can to learn the language. And I know I mentioned that in my application too, that I didn't have any Chinese Mandarin knowledge, but that I already started learning it and was Already, and I was going to take classes in, in country. So yeah, that's a bit about to me. I'll let Peyton go, but I just want to say if you have any question, big or small, just please let us know. We are just so happy and here to help. So yeah, let us know. Thank you so much. And Peyton, I'll let you talk and then uh, we'll open it up for questions. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, I'm going to say everything you just said is very much a reflection of my experiences as well. I wish I would have given you a more robust um, pick kind of photo um, variation like you did, but I and the whole process going through and how I ended up in Cardiff and how my experience was. So kind of touching on that before I give you kind of the photo briefing. So yeah, kind of like you, I knew I wanted to do my um, master's program. I knew specifically I wanted to do my master's of public health. Um, I was a biology major with a minor of medical humanities and culture at USC. And I graduated in 2021 from the honors college as well. Um, so I knew going through my degree that I was more interested in the social side of health. So I knew I wanted to dip my toe in the water, maybe dabble with some research um, because I did do my senior thesis on very much a concentration of health policy. And I actually did my thesis on um, kind of a comparative approach from the US and Wales looking at refugee health policy. So I think that kind of fueled my interest in going to Cardiff University as a Fulbright Award. Um, so kind of how the application process looked is, so I knew I wanted to do it. I went through pretty much the same info session that you were right now. Um, I'm pretty sure it was in person. I remember sitting in a very daunting conference room looking at all the fellowship options. Um, I knew I definitely wanted to come study in the UK. I knew I was kind of in love with um, British culture, but I, what I didn't know is how um, different every nation was in Britain. So obviously you have England, you had Wales where I was, Scotland, Northern Ireland. Um, all that jazz but a lot of people didn't know Wales existed so when I told them that I was applying to Fulbright at Cardiff they're like oh you're going to England you're going to Oxford you're living in London and um although I am in London at the moment um I was at Cardiff at the time going to Cardiff Uni for my Fulbright but yeah so going through the application process obviously um had many of many drafts of essays and I know it's probably daunting thinking what will I write my personal statement about um what will I include did I do anything of significance going forward what are they looking for? But I just want to tell you that I wrote my personal statement entirely on the Beatles. Um, and so how the Beatles tied to being interested in public health, that it was for the Fulbright board to decide. But um, just know that you can really write it on whichever angle you want and present that. And I think the Fulbright um, board and committee really values uniqueness. Um, and kind of really individual interests. So I kind of tied that in, kind of speaking on that, um, because Cardiff is actually the um, national, or I guess UK's city of music. So I thought that that was a really interesting approach. And I'm also personally like love the Beatles. So that's kind of how I tied that in. But that was just kind of my personal approach going into the application process. Um, but kind of how I chose Cardiff Uni is um, they had a very, very renowned um, public health social science center that was doing a lot of research that I was very interested in. Um, and I did connect with an affiliate there. Her name was Rhiannon Evans. And I was able to assist her on a bunch of research projects going throughout my master's degree, um, as well as doing my MPH at the time. So that was really, really helpful going through and kind of getting that initial connection and introduction to Welsh culture. Um, but throughout my year at Cardiff, it was incredible, probably one of the best years of my life. I met so many different people in my course from 
all around the world. I was taught by a lot of leaders in the NHS for Public Health Wales, and it was at a very interesting time when COVID was at the precipice of everything and Brexit was happening. So I got a very unique perspective um, going through. And honestly, I only have full right to thank and um, their kind of um, help throughout it all. Um, yeah, no, but going forward, um, I think kind of um, looking at like the Fulbright Association and their connection with me throughout the entire program, it was absolutely incredible. Um, there was a lot of events for me in the UK of going to the US Embassy. There were invites to go do that um, and kind of meet other Fulbrighters. There were also conferences that we did across the UK where we met and presented on our research um, going through, which was very exciting to kind of meet other people and seeing what programs that they were going through at the time. So that was kind of by experiences and kind of touching on these photos. So me in this castle. So Wales is actually the most concentrated country of castles in the entire world. So I thought, including this, this is actually the castle called Caffili Castle, which I believe is the largest castle in Europe, which is very exciting. And that's probably only around half an hour out of Cardiff. Um, then this top right one is me in Edinburgh. I actually took a trip up to Edinburgh. One of my best friends went to Cambridge. Um, so we actually went up there and did a trip together, which was absolutely lovely. And this last one is actually recently, it was on a cable car over London where I am working at the moment. Um, so I think like um, support post Fulbright has been great for the Fulbright Association as well, really connecting with alumni and um, maybe not even encouraging you to go back to the US, but really endeavoring on what you learned in that program and continuing cultural connections throughout wherever you're working in the workplace. So that's kind of been my experience, but um, yeah, I'm more than happy to chat with anyone about the application process or more about my experiences or answer any other questions. I can drop my email in the chat as well. And if you have any questions, but yeah, that's kind of a briefing of my experience and what I did throughout. Thank you both so much. So I'll give everyone a second. Um, you can feel free to unmute yourselves, ask questions. Um, please do, we have excellent uh, resources right here for you um, in the form of Tamara and Peyton. Uh, you can also throw your questions in the chat, but I wanted to ask uh, one question is, what was the, um, I don't know, what was, I guess a double prong question. What was the most difficult part of the application process and what part was the most helpful or something that you really are glad you took advantage? or wish you would have? That's a tough question. And I think for the most difficult part of the application process, I have two answers. Um, I would say one, just the initial drafting of essays, because I know for me, you could easily feel discouraged if you get an essay back and half of it's crossed out, but really knowing at the end of the day that it is for the better and not everyone at NFSP has very much like, um, more broader picture scope of um, kind of what Fulbright Commission is looking for. And um, yeah, kind of keeping that in mind throughout and really revising and just getting to almost the nitty gritty of every point that you're trying to make and just knowing that it's going to turn out good. But I think actually going through the process, it is kind of, as I said before, daunting because you're like, oh, am I a bad writer? Really second guessing yourself, you know, but the finished product that you get is probably um, the best. But I would say the second portion that was the most difficult would probably be the interview. Um, the interview, it was a fifth, the semi-finalist interview, I kind of want to specify, um, that happened in, I believe, January or February, so right before finalist notifications were given out. For me, it was a 15-minute rapid-fire kind of interview round, and um, after that, I very much second-guessed myself. I was like, hey, did I do well enough in this 15 minutes to present the commission? Um, everything I had to offer and really like they are just looking for that connection to the place that you are applying to looking for a general purpose looking for something kind of greater than oh I just want to go have fun in another country you know they really want that cultural connection to be cultivated and um, before that I had had many like, tips from people who have been on interview boards and that's very much what they kind of drove home for me is that you needed to emphasize that you were there for the cultural connection and the diplomacy aspect of it but I would say those were probably the two most difficult portions of my application process. I see a question. What is one thing you wish you knew before applying to the Fulbright? I guess I'll, I'll answer that first. I guess I wish I knew just how far this is going to sound so cliche, but just how far it can take you because it really can. Like my life has taken a completely different trajectory because of the Fulbright program. I originally thought I was going to go to medical school, chemistry degree. I even wrote that in my Fulbright application. So that's another thing. 
just make sure you know how to weave your story and what makes sense for your, what you talk about with your future plans afterwards. But it's okay if the, your future plans change because the Fulbright, I was there for almost two years. My graduate degree program was one and a half years. So that's another thing. Even though the grant is for one year, if your program's longer, you'll get additional funding depending on your GPA for the next year. But yeah, it's just, just allow it to take you where you're, um, you're going to go. Like, don't just have these like stringent goals in mind like okay you really you go over there you realize oh I really love this aspect of research or I really love teaching and then don't be afraid to pivot because I know I originally thought I was going to med school now I'm going back to school for international relations so you just never know but to Heidi's question earlier too and similar to Peyton I will say I know you all are probably in different parts of um, your education at USC so some may be juniors sophomores seniors but I know I was applying to Fulbright in the fall of my senior year and the hardest thing is just time management is and I was in an internship that summer before so starting the application and starting to draft my personal statement and contacting my rec recommenders for letters of recommendation and you're also trying to finish all your classes write your thesis it's, it's really a lot so really just Spending time every day on something related to the Fulbright process really helped me. Yeah, I agree with everything you just said. I was actually, yeah, I was on the same trajectory as you. Um, I was actually accepted into medical school and deferred for a year, thinking um, I was coming home um, yeah. to go. And yeah, I ended up staying in the UK. So yeah, I would say that was probably, again, um, the same as um, you, my biggest thing that I wish I knew before I did Fulbright that I shouldn't have kind of a 10, 15 year plan ready to go. Because again, you don't know which direction Fulbright will be taking you and how many connections it actually has um, in the space that you're living. So, yeah. yeah. I see there's another question in the chat. Um, what, if, what would you have done differently through the application process or while being abroad on the program? Good question. That is a really good question. I'm actually trying to think. Um, hmm. I don't know. I don't know if I would do it differently because <laughs> it, it worked out. I mean, yeah. No, yeah, same for me. I think kind of everything I plan to get involved in. Um, I did very much really off the bat of getting to Cardiff, mm -hmm. which was great for me. I actually, um, I know I didn't really touch on this, but I was volunteering with a refugee resettlement agency in Cardiff. So that kind of started almost the month in. Um, I was really endeavoring in like my research there as well as my master's. So I was very, very busy. And I feel like I, I kind of did everything and I didn't really have time. Um, to do any more because I feel like I was soaking up everything but I say maybe one thing that I wish I would have done was getting involved more so with student organizations at the university and maybe like sports teams which I think is very silly because that's not even in the context of what Fulbright um, is associated with but I think really like making connections throughout the entire university not just my course is maybe something that I wish I would have done um, more so than I did but yeah I felt like my timetable was very much full um, going into it. I guess I can say that what I would have done differently through the application process is earlier on in my drafts talk about, especially for the personal statement, because they really want to know about you as a person. And I was just talking about more about research I had done and wanted to do, but I have done so many other things outside of just research and academics. I did marching band all throughout USC and high school, play the violin. Um, I'm trying to think about what else I talked about. But once I finally got to the final draft, I had talked them a lot more about other things that I was involved in. And how that would connect to my experience in cultural exchange, things like that. So don't be afraid to talk about things that you may not think are related directly to research, academics, in, um, in your Fulbright application. And here we have another, y'all are asking really good questions and providing very good answers, but do you have any other advice for someone who may be intimidated to start the application process due to time management, lack of time specifically? This yeah, is, and I will. 
Um, okay. I'm highly pleased. <laughs> I was just going to say, I will show you in a minute, like kind of how uh, our office helps you to stay on track. Um, with Fulbright is a pretty big commitment, but like the great news is you're here, you're starting early, um, which is like absolutely the best thing you can do for yourself to set yourself up for success for Fulbright. Um, but I'll let Tamara, you can, you can expand upon that. I'll just say that it's never, as long as it's before the USC deadline, it's never too late to start. Even for the most recent fellowship I applied for, I started so late. And you can really get down, you can get down on yourself and just think, oh, I'm never going to get it. Some people started literally so early, their freshman year or something, started thinking about it. And I just found out about it. I found out about it my junior year as well. So you just, you never know. Like, don't count yourself out because for my um, year when I was applying to my master's degree program in global health, there were three um, three awards available for the master's degree in global health. And you also can just get into your head about the numbers, like, oh, all these people are applying. Why are they going to choose me? So you just really have to have faith in yourself. And as long and the National Scholarships and Fellowships Program will help you put forward a great and a competitive application. So I really would just say you just really have to believe in yourself truly that you deserve to be there. And as long as you put in a good application, they're going to see that and move forward from there. You just, you never know. And you always have more time too. If you want to get more experience, you can apply again. I know I had a friend who applied her first time, didn't get it and got it the second time. So you just don't count your setup out. You have way more experience than you think. And with the time management thing, yeah, I'm, it is the hardest part. It really is. But as long as you get it in by that campus deadline, you have time after that before the October deadline to tweak it and everything. So, yeah. Yeah, I definitely agree with all that. I know for me, I um, I wasn't really intending to apply to Fulbright and then um, COVID hit the summer kind of before my senior year. And I was like, oh, I actually, you know, I attended an info session. I wanted to go, but that was me kind of preparing my application in the summer. And then I had a friend who actually went to the University of Southampton on a Fulbright in the UK. Um, her name is Ashley. I mean, she was at USC and she decided to make her application three weeks before the application deadline, you know. So there is obviously those two broad end scales of the spectrum for sure. But yeah, no, I would say definitely never second guess yourself. I think stay motivated by your passions and where you want to end up and just know again, like don't count yourself out. Um, you basically deserve to be there. And I know even if you throw together like a personal statement with bare bones, the National Fellowships Office will do some wizardry um, with a few rounds of edits and will make something absolutely beautiful out of your application. So don't be intimidated by making a an absolutely stellar draft your first go round. Just know that the bare bones and structure, um, I swear National Fellowships does some magic. So um, don't be intimidated by kind of producing a like absolutely excellent first draft the first go round um so yeah i would definitely say prioritize the application but also um kind of if you have some points to make you can just present those and yeah um with through meetings with your advisors and things something great will be put together i will add to that on the fulbright website they have all under like personal statement, things that they want you to cover under statement of grant purpose. And I remember going through that early on and just making bullet points for everything I want to cover and then finally getting a draft. So if you're a list person, go through all the questions they have on there, what they want to cover, what they want to see cover under each um, point and just make sure you have something listed for all those points. That can help you at least get started. Thank you. And we have one uh, more question. I'm going to have that, have you answer that really quickly. And then we're going to pause on questions. I'm going to go through kind of the next steps of the process. because I know we're getting close to five. Um, but did either of your uh, locations or program interests change during the application process? And if so, how? I'll just say quickly, mine didn't change. I knew from my a study bar program in Costa Rica, and I didn't have a global health um, background that I wanted to learn more about global health and get a master's degree and get it paid for. And so that, that checked all my boxes with Fulbright. And then when it came to picking my country, there were a limited number of countries that had global health or public health degrees and, and 
I had never been to Taiwan. I didn't know the language. And I saw it as an exciting opportunity to go somewhere new. And it's National Taiwan University is one is the best university at, in Taiwan. Or that's well, that's subject to opinion, but that's what a lot of people say. And so it just checked out my boxes. And yeah, it was always Taiwan. But I went through that list early on of all the graduate degree programs and narrowed it down. Yeah, I very much do the same as I kind of touched on before. Um, I know I wanted to come to the UK and looking at universities, Cardiff University was in the Russell Group, which is the top seven universities in the UK. Um, There's really no equivalent in the US to compare it to, um, but they had um, everything I was looking for really. And that was kind of where I honed interest just because of my thesis that I had previously discussed before and also a few unique policies that are specific to Wales and um, focusing on health policy in my MPH. That was um, like very much of interest to me and kind of making that initial research connection at the university um, really didn't have my university changing too much. But I think that was very much because of a lot of research on the back end of not really changing my preference of location and just kind of knowing a general area that I wanted to go to based on kind of past research and experiences and things. Um, but yeah, no, I definitely recommend checking out all programs. I know I went through the list of Fulbright so many times and looked into everything that every university has to offer. So it definitely was um, very much time consuming on the back end, but um, definitely worth it once you hone in somewhere that you really connect to and find interest in. Thank you. Yeah, and if you don't know quite where you want to go yet, that's absolutely fine. Um, that's another thing that we can help you with. Again, with our in our set of like magical tools, our wizardry kit, um, we also can help you figure out kind of which fellowship is going to be or which location might be the best for you if you're looking like at an English teaching assistantship. You're deciding between like I don't know Vietnam and Ghana. What's the difference? What are your goals? How does that connect? So we can help you brainstorm that as well. So in the interest of time, I am going to um, move forward in our slideshow just to hopefully get a couple more slides in before we all have to run. Um, this session is recorded, so I will be sharing the recording at the end. Um, tell your friends. So now that you've kind of have an overview of what Fulbright is, what you can do with it, um, are feeling really inspired, how are you going to manage your time? So this is where, again, we come in as a team is to help you really keep yourself on track for Fulbright through our campus process. So this is probably the most valuable part of what our office offers in terms of Fulbright support. So I definitely encourage you to take advantage of this. So basically what we will do is once we're aware of who you are and you're interested in Fulbright, um, you'll come into our Fulbright process. So from May to June, that's where you'll complete a preliminary application, which is basically just a form that tells us I'm interested in Fulbright. Um, thank you, Peyton. Uh, yes, please go to sleep. <laughs> thank yeah, thank you. For you. I worked more. But thank you guys. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. -bye. Um, so in by that's the priority deadline to complete preliminary application, which gives us the information that we need to pair you with a, a Fulbright program advisor mentor. So this is a faculty member who has volunteered their time to mentor Fulbright students. So not only will you have our office to help with advising, you'll also have your very own faculty member who will help you uh, work on your essays, think about uh, research projects, get, get affiliations kind of rolling, all those types of things. So you have plenty of um, support from us. From June to August, that's going to be the bulk of when you are working on your application materials, your essays. And this is a general process overview, but we'll actually have um, some check-in dates for you to share drafts of your essays with your FPA, just so you can make sure that you're keeping on track um, for that Fulbright campus deadline. So August 16th is the campus deadline. Your draft does not have to be like 100% final, but it should be a draft that's been reviewed by the, F the FPA. Uh, maybe our office, but it should be a polished, solid draft. And what that draft does is we collect the draft and then we will put together a campus feedback session for you. Again, with faculty members who uh, are in your discipline, who know the area, who know Fulbright, who read over it and give you like a bunch of feedback that you can then incorporate into your application. So that's probably the single most valuable part that, of the application process. And then we give your application back to you and you can incorporate all those materials, um, all that feedback, finalize those materials and then submit it before the deadline in October. So it seems like we're starting really early, but like this is to help you stay on track um, for the October 10th deadline. 
That being said, probably wouldn't recommend it, but like you can start October 1st and do all of this and you don't even have to talk to us actually. Uh, but the campus process gives you all of that additional feedback, all of that additional support. So definitely take advantage of it if you are able to. So again, you don't have to do it alone. Again, back to the fellowship. Um, you are Frodo, but you have your, your nine companions with you. Um, so you, you us, um, fellowship peer mentors are folks who have been there, done that. So um, Tamir and Peyton are here, uh, hopefully to answer some of your questions if you have them. Um, campus partners, friends and family, you have a lot of support here. So definitely you're not doing this alone. We're here to cheer you on and to support you. So, okay. Your turn. Um, thank you so much, Tamara, for throwing your email in the chat. And I'll send um, these slides, the recording, and their emails in my wrap-up email probably tomorrow. Um, so feel free to type in the chat what kind of Fulbright you're most interested in, where, why, um, while I go ahead and talk about strong application. Again, Fulbright is all about fit. So that is the number one thing is finding the Fulbright program that's right for you. Starting early, you've already got that down. Um, the application actually opens on uh, April 1st. So you're plenty early uh, to get in right off the gate, get to know your faculty, you'll be asked them for recommendations. Um, so building those strong connections, thinking about depth of knowledge over breadth of knowledge, and really thinking about how you can showcase um, your interest and passion in the area that you're choosing to study or research uh, more in depth. Demonstrating your interests, again, that can be varied from academic interests to leadership, to community service, to hobbies. They want to know about you and what makes you happy, what makes you passionate, what, what is your, like, where does your curiosity lie and how do you, how do you express that? Be open to feedback. Again, um, as Peyton mentioned, this is a process that can feel pretty daunting. Um, and just so you know, no one's first draft is Everyone's draft is far from perfect and it's probably pretty terrible the first draft. Doesn't matter if you are Stephen King or Heidi Bretz writing an application, writing a, writing a draft. The first one's always a little bit rough, but we are here to um, help you refine that to really craft an application that reflects who you are and shows that to the Fulbright Committee. So you're an expert on you. We're um, experts on what Fulbright is looking for. So we work together to help you craft your strongest application. So being open to feedback and knowing that you are the final author of this piece. So again, everything is a suggestion and you can incorporate uh, what you feel is true to you from what we share, what your full or faculty uh, FPA shares. Um, you are the final, you get the final say on everything. Use your resources, including us. Um, so how do you do that? How do you get started with this process? So first off, explore the Fulbright website, take a look around, um, use, they have a really cool award search feature. So if you're still trying to figure out where you wanna go or what, what places might be a good fit for um, finding a, a global health degree, you can use their search engine. Make an appointment with a fellowship advisor to discuss the application process. So we'll help answer your uh, more specific questions and also um, help you get started on the brainstorming in, with your, your application process. So how to do that? If you're an undergrad, you can find me on that. your best bet. We're under involvement and engagement. Um, grad students can meet with Matt um, at calendly.com grad slash grad fellowships. And alumni, you can email me directly um, to set up an appointment. And then finally, after you've had this meeting and have gotten to know and you're really interested and committed to applying for Fulbright this year, then you'll fill out what we call an intent to apply form, just puts you on our radar so that we can continue to follow up with you. So that is all I have. We're about five minutes over. So I'm happy to hang on for just a couple moments. Um, if you have questions, I'll also be sending you a um, survey. If you'd be so kind as to fill it out, let us know if you love this presentation, if you have notes, um, we really do take your feedback seriously and we want these to be really helpful for you. So hopefully you have found um, some value in this time together. But I'm happy to hang on for a few more minutes for questions. But thank you for coming. And I hope to see um, you all on my calendar soon. Thank you.